Well, have you ever noticed your perspective of something, the way you see something, the perspective of, of, of something, changes how you understand things, how you see things? Uh, I found a list this week of the children's, or some, kids' perspective on science. And I thought I would share some of them because they were cute. And I had some PowerPoint fun with them this, this week. So um, here are some kids' perspective on certain things as it relates to science. There are three kinds of blood vessels. Arteries, and this is how they spell them. Arteries, veins, and caterpillars. <laughs> That's a different perspective. Here's another one. Water is composed of two gins. Oxygen and hydrogen. Oxygen is pure gin. Hydrogen is gin and water. <laughs> now that changes your perspective on uh, uh, oxygen, doesn't it? Uh, the gins. Rhubarb is a kind of celery gone bloodshot. <laughs> So you take a piece of it with peanut butter on it. <laughs> that would change your perspective again. Blood flows down one leg and up the other. <laughs> now, I'm not sure how you think that happens. <laughs> it must jump between the toes. I, I'm not sure. But there's a perspective. Before giving uh, a blood transfusion, find out if the blood is affirmative or negative. <laughs> That's at least close. <laughs> to keep milk from turning sour, keep it in the cow. <laughs> that would work. And here's my favorite. To collect fumes of sulfur, hold a deacon over a flame in a test tube. <laughs> Uh, that was my favorite. <laughs> to talk about perspectives. To talk about perspectives. Uh, if you had that perspective, it would change how you saw things. It would change what you thought of things. And I thought, you know, kids, kids aren't the only ones who have a different perspective on things. And I always hesitate to bring this up, but I think it's the best illustration that I can use. Um, take this political season. For uh, example, your perspective of a particular candidate affects how you view that candidate. And, and it amazes me, we just had the, the third and final debate here this last week, it amazes me how a person's perspective determines the outcome of the debate. I, I will turn on the news, and again, I'm not making any kind of political statement, but you turn on the news, and you watch one of the commentators, or some of the ones they're interviewing, say, wow, Donald Trump just slammed that debate. He did a wonderful job. It was amazing. And then you listen to somebody on the other side say, wow, Hillary Clinton did an amazing job at that debate. She just clobbered him. And then you listen to them go on and you think, okay, did they watch the same debate? <laughs> because you can't find a lick of agreement between the two of them. What's the difference? Their perspective. What they wanted to see at the debate determined what they saw at the debate. And it determined in their mind at least who won and who benefited the most from, from that debate. I was thinking as well, and I've kind of said this already, but our perspective of something changes our view of reality. Our perspective changes our view of reality. Now, we're winding down uh, as a soccer team at the school. We're winding down our soccer season. Uh, we find out late tonight or sometime tonight uh, when we're going to play our, our district game uh, this week. And, and uh, once you get into districts, obviously, you lose and you're done. And so we're, we're near the end of our season. But I was thinking about one of the games, and probably Rob was there, so probably Rob can attest to this, and if, if somebody else was there other than Annette, I, I missed you. But uh, it, it's always amazing to get done with a soccer game and to view the different perspectives of the game. And, and recently, and I, I share this one because it seems lopsided, uh, recently we played Athens uh, girls at the school. And at the end of the night, uh, we lost the game 9-1. to one. 
We lost the game 9-1. 9, uh, now we've lost the first time to them 9 to nothing. And 9 is the most goals that a team has ever given up that I've coached. I've never given up a team, or given up as a coach, 9 goals to a team. Um, but I thought, you know, there's different perspectives on that game. My perspective on that game is, we played a really good game. Uh, and I say that for a number of things. We scored a goal. Uh, there have been numerous NTL teams that have not even come close to scoring, scoring a goal uh, against the, a very talented Athens team. So we scored a goal. To me, that was a victory. Uh, I also looked at the team and said, you know what? We played really hard. The girls gave 100%. They really did play hard during that game. The girls did what we asked them to. And for parts of the game, we held our own. Um, and so, you know, in my opinion, we were simply outplayed by a better, a better team. But because of that perspective, when I look back at that game in the season, I say, no, that was a really good game. That was a really good game, even though the score reflected a, a lopsided loss. Now, another perspective, and nobody said this to me, but, but another perspective of the game is this. Well, you guys played awful. That was terrible. You lost nine, you gave up nine goals. How can you say that was a good game when most soccer games end two to one, one to nothing, three to two? Um, our offense was having trouble getting the ball into the net. Our defense couldn't seem to stop the other team from scoring. And the goalie allowed him some shots that never should have gone into goal. It was a terrible game. We failed. Now, why would somebody say that? They had a completely different perspective. They had a completely different way of evaluating and looking at the game based on their perspective of the game. Uh, and so, you know, our, our perspective affects what we believe and affects the reality of how we see things. Well, the same thing is certainly true spiritually speaking. The same thing is true spiritually. Our perspective of God and the working of God in our lives, our perspective has a great impact on the reality of how we see God working in our lives. It really does. My understanding of God and how God works, my perspective of God, has a tremendous effect on seeing the reality of God working in my life. And, and one of the places that we see that is in Psalm 73. In, in Psalm 73, Asaph has a perspective of God. But the reality that he sees in life doesn't equal his perspective. There, there's a problem there. There's a disconnect there. And, and, and so something isn't right. And, and Asaph, I think, does a great job of, of, of sharing his struggle and the conflict between his, his perspective and, and the reality that he sees. Now, Asaph was a man who was appointed by David to worship God before the ark of God in the, uh, the sanctuary of God. And we read that back in 1 Chronicles chapter 16. In other words, Asaph was somebody who worked in the sanctuary. He worked in the, the place of worship, and he worshipped there. I would, I would dare say in some way he led the worship. He was a part of the worship team, as we might say today. In 1 Chronicles 25, he was appointed along with his family to be a, a musician uh, in the worship of God. In other words, he came up and he, he was part of the, the team that played the music and the sang, and, and they worshipped God. So he was, he was a leader when it came to worship. In verse 1, Asaph states what his perspective of God is. He says in verse 1, Truly God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Now, Asaph's perspective of God probably is much the same as what most of us have. God is good. And if I said this morning, uh, who believes that God is good, we'd all raise our hand. God is good. Again, we say this often because we're sitting in church, right? It would be bad to be to church and not say that God is good. And, and so Asaph believed that. He said God is good. And, and he qualified that as well. He says God is good to who? Those that are of a pure heart. And specifically Israel is what he's thinking of here. 
God is good to those who are pure in heart. God is good to those who strive to please God and strive to walk with God. Now, what did he mean by that? What, how did Asaph understand that? Now, I'm going to share some ideas, and, and you'll see where I get these as we go through the text. But right now, rather than go through the text, I, I just want to share what I believe about Asaph and what he understood that to mean. God is good. Asaph understood that to mean this. If I walk with the Lord, God will make me successful. If I don't walk with God, I will fail. And I will have hardship and difficulty. That's Asaph's understanding of God is good. He also understood that to mean the humble will be lifted up by the Lord, and those filled with pride will be put down and humiliated. That's how Asaph understood that. He also understood it to mean those who pursue God will have their needs met in excess, and those who ignore God will struggle. Now, I'm not saying that's what it means that God is good. But I believe that as we read through Psalm 73, that's what Asaph believed when he said God is good. In a nutshell, he believed, if you pursue God, God will bless you with all kinds of great things. He'll make you healthy and wise and rich, and you'll have plenty if you don't pursue God, if you, if you ignore God, if you live a sinful life, then God will judge you for that. That is what Asaph's understanding of God is good to Israel means. Now, let me ask this this morning. Don't we generally, when we say God is good, think of God is good in the same light? Don't, don't we often think of it in the same light? God is good. My cancer is in remission. I'm getting better. Why, God is good. God is good. I was in a traffic accident this week and, and I didn't get hurt. Why, God is really good. God is good. I got an unexpected check in the mail and, and I was able to meet my needs this week. God is good. God is good. My relationship with, with uh, somebody that had been struggling has been restored. When we say God is good, isn't that how we often think of God is good? Isn't that the perspective that we normally have? Do we often hear somebody say, you know, God is really good. I was in a car accident and got really badly hurt this week. Do we ever say that? Does that mean God is not good because I got hurt? That doesn't mean that at all. But we often, when we think God is good, we often think of it in terms of all of these great things that, that we want or need, and, and God brings them in, into our lives. That's how we often think of God is good. That's how Asaph thought God is good. That's exactly what his understanding was. Now, let's move on here a little bit. Because Asaph's perception, his perspective, that God is good met with the reality of what he saw in life. And what Asaph saw in life didn't quite match what his perspective of God was. And in verse 2, Asaph says, after saying God is good, he said, but as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps nearly slipped. He said, I, I started with this perspective, but then I saw something that I said, no, that doesn't make any sense at all. Something's wrong. And he almost, I, I understand this to mean he almost gave up on serving God. He almost said, you know what? It's not worth it. Because even though I believe God is good, I don't see that God is good. And then he goes on here and he shares what he saw. And I'm going to try to more or less summarize this rather than to go into great detail on, on each aspect of this. But the first thing he saw, starting in verse 3, was the prosperity of the wicked. The prosperity of the wicked. Asaph is, you know, walking the streets, and he sees all of these people that are not godly. They don't come to the temple. They don't worship God. They don't care about God. And he says, but they're prospering in their, their businesses and their lives. I, I don't get it. Now, let me, say, let me ask this before I move on. Anybody ever thought that? I have. Thomas and I are the only two. 
I have many times. Many, many, many times I have looked and thought, what in the world am I doing wrong? Because I, I think that I'm living a godly life. I strive to live a godly life, and I'm struggling. And then I look at this guy over here, and I'm not pointing at anybody in the back row. Uh, I look at this guy over here, and I think, he doesn't even care about God. And look how well he's doing in life. Why aren't I doing that well in life? I don't get it. Now, the easy thing would be to say, well, Asaph shouldn't have been comparing himself with other people. And it, it, I wouldn't argue with that. I wouldn't argue with that. But at the same time, the truth is that we live with and around people who are not godly. And I don't have to be looking to compare myself to them to realize at times that they're doing really well and I'm not. I don't have to study their lives to see that. All I have to do is live life. And I can see that. And so I don't know here that I'm ready to criticize Asaph for looking at the lives of those around him and, and, and being jealous to some degree. And struggling with the fact that they're doing well and he's not. He's living life. And he sees those that are evil and they're prospering. And then I don't know if he's even looking at himself or he's looking at the others that are living godly and he sees them having trouble making ends meet and putting food on the table. And he says, I don't get it. I don't understand it. In verse 4, he says they have no pains until death. And the best I can understand that is this. It would seem as if their lives just flow nicely from day to day. And they have no worries and no concerns and nothing to struggle with. Uh, and he says, I'm just the opposite of that. And he said, my feet almost slipped. In verse 4, I always love it when they say this in scripture. He says, I look at them and they're fat and sleek. They're fat and sleek. The idea of fat and sleek here is simply that they have excess he said, you know, I, I see this family over here that's a godly family and they have trouble finding food to feed themselves for supper. And I look over here and there's this ungodly family and, and they've got steak and potatoes and, and excess and, and they're fat. They have more than they need is all that he's saying. And he says, I'm struggling with that. In verse 5, they, they seem to have less trouble than other people do. In verse 6, they're filled with pride and proud of it. They're not even ashamed of their pride. They're puffed up, they're proud, they know it, and they're, they're proud of it. Not only do they have excess, but their hearts are filled with follies, he says. They're enjoying life in excess. They, they appear not to have a care in the world. Beginning in verse 8, he summarizes what he saw. He said, they scoff and they speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens. Their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge of the Most High? But these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. He says they're wicked. And not only are they wicked, they strut around in their wickedness. And not only do they strut around in their wickedness, they mock God. Now, it's one thing not to live a godly life. It's another thing to mock God. And he says, I, you know, I'm not mocking God. I'm living a godly life. They're, they're mocking God. They're saying, who's God? How can he know? God doesn't know anything. And yet they're fat, and they're sleek, and they're prospering. And, and he says, I don't understand it. I'm struggling. Beginning in verse 13, he shares his frustration. He says, all in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Asaph looks at reality, compares it to his perspective that God is good, and he says, I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my time. I'm trying to worship God. I'm trying to put God first. I'm trying to live a godly life. I am wasting my time. And he said, I almost spoke that. I all 
almost, in a sense, I, I think he's saying, I almost preached it. I almost said to those that are godly, what are you doing? Don't you know you're wasting your time? And, and he says, I almost said that. If I had, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. He's speaking to God here. I would have betrayed God. I would have betrayed the children of God. And, and I said, you know, Asaph here in his struggle is doing the right thing. He's desperately seeking to know the answer to those things. And, and it's interesting to me because in that verse, rather than cry out to people and complain to people, he cried out to God. And he complained to God. He poured out his heart before God and said, I really want to know these things. I really want to understand these things. And, and uh, to take a break from this for a minute, I wonder how many of us have ever done that? Have you ever, don't raise your hand, have you ever done that? Have you ever been so frustrated at what you thought God should be doing and what reality showed that God was or wasn't doing? that you just poured out your heart to God and maybe screamed and yelled at God and said, I'm frustrated, I'm upset, I give it up, I have no idea. Seems irreverent, doesn't it? It's not. It's interesting to me that God never condemned Asaph for his complaint. It doesn't say Asaph, come on, man, get it right. It doesn't say that. He doesn't slap him upside the head. He answers him. He answers him. And, and, and I can... I, I can't even begin to name the number of times that I have been angry and upset and not knowing how to respond, what to do, how to even think about it, that I've done exactly what Asaph did. Cried out and said, God, I'm angry. You know what I'm struggling with. and I don't know the answer. I don't know how it's going to end. I don't even know how I'm going to deal with it tomorrow. And been very blunt and very forthright um, and just presented that to God. That's exactly what Asaph did. And the interesting thing to me is when we do that, how, how God answers and how God works. And, and if you notice here, he says, beginning in verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. It, it didn't seem like I was going to make sense of it at all until I went into the sanctuary of God. Until I went into the sanctuary of God. When Asaph cried out to God, he got up from his prayer, and I don't know whether this was five minutes or five days or five months, it doesn't say. He got up from this time in prayer, and at some point he walked into the sanctuary of God. I'm guessing it was fairly quickly because he worked in the sanctuary of God. He walked into the sanctuary of God, and what changed? What changed? It wasn't the reality. It wasn't that he walked into the sanctuary of God and the wicked immediately started suffering and, and struggling. That didn't change. The only thing that changed is his perspective. What he saw in his mind. How he understood God. How he understood the working of God. That changed. We see at the end of verse uh, 17, he says, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You will make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. What changed was his perspective. He saw God's working differently. He was given here an eternal perspective, not just a short-term earthly perspective. His perspective changed. And, and just to summarize that, he says, you know what I saw? God will reward people accordingly in his time. God will reward people accordingly in his time. Whether it's now or whether it's later, God will reward people in his time. And God will reward the wicked. God will reward the righteous. Just because the reality I see now uh, demonstrates that God is allowing the wicked to prosper doesn't mean that they'll prosper forever. It doesn't mean that God won't reward the righteous. You know, I, as I was reading that, I thought, you know, this is not a celebration of the fact that God's going to judge me. It's not that at all. In Ezekiel 33, Ezekiel uh, 
It says, Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? The Lord doesn't take pleasure in the judgment of the wicked. And, and I don't think Asaph here is taking pleasure in the fact that someday the wicked are going to suffer. I don't think this is a moment of celebration. It's a moment of perspective. It's a moment of saying, you know what? God will reward people according to their righteousness or their wickedness. God will hold them accountable. Now, where does that perspective come from? Where does that come from? Uh, probably we could say a lot of things. But what I want to back up to is verse 1 again. Where he says, truly God is good to Israel. Asaph's understanding or perspective of God is good was different than God's perspective of God is good. And it was interesting this week because I was struggling through some of these things. And I thought, you know, we as children of God need to have the right perspective when we say God is good. And it probably is different than what most of us think when we think God is good. And I was thinking about some of these things, and my mind was running all over the place. And so, well, I took a walk for about an hour. And it was interesting how often when I do that, God teaches me something. And, and here's, here's what I think, and I, I left it up here on the power plate. Here is what our view of God is good is. Our view of God is good. The good things God gives or does for us. Is that how we view good? It is. God does good things for me. God gives me good things. God is good. What's God's perspective of good, though? What's God's perspective of good? Here's what God's perspective is. The good things God accomplishes in my life. Notice the difference? If God is allowing something bad, in our opinion, or negative, in our opinion, to come into our lives... How can that be good? How can I say God is good? It's good because God is using that to accomplish something. Else. And that is what the character of God's goodness is. Because that's an eternal perspective. It's not just here and now and short term. Now, I shared this in my men's Sunday school class this morning, and I'll share it as we close. And most of you will know who I'm talking about, and that's fine. It's, it's not a secret. But Annette and I went over to uh, the funeral at Neath yesterday morning. Uh, a fellow that was killed uh, a week ago, tragically, in a uh, tractor accident. Tragic accident, tragic, the whole thing. And uh, we waited yesterday and for his wife to come in so that we could talk with her. And, and she came in and we gave her a hug and you know, said, oh, I'm really sorry for, for, you know, what happened. And you know what the first thing out of her mouth was yesterday? God is good. God is good. And she said, let me, let me tell you how God has used that in work in my life this last week. And I thought, oh my word. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm preaching on tomorrow morning. And she said, you know, well, let me tell you how good God is. Here's how God's met my needs this week. Here's how God has worked this week. Here's how God has used that. And I thought, there is the right perspective right there. And I'm not saying that she's not struggling, because she is. She's human. And we all are. But what if we adopt that perspective of God's goodness? Most of us would not stand there and say, well, I lost my spouse this week, but God's really good. What we would say is, where was God? Why didn't God protect him? Why didn't God save him? Why didn't God help that not to happen? Where is God? That's what we normally do. Because our perspective of God is good, is the good things God brings into my life. God's perspective of good is how He uses things in our lives. One is eternal. One is not. One will pass away. One won't. God is good. 
even when we see what seems to be the opposite of that. God is still good. God is good if I'm in a car accident and I'm healthy. God is good if I'm in a car accident and I'm killed. God is good if I have cancer and it goes into remission. God is good if I have cancer and it takes my life. God is good. And our perspective determines the reality of how we understand and how we see that in our lives. Let us take a moment and bow for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, this morning I thank you for the fact that you are good. I thank you for your goodness in our day-to-day -day lives. I thank you for the good things that you bring into our lives. But Lord, I thank you as well for the bad, seemingly bad things that you bring into our lives. Because ultimately your word says that everything that comes into our lives will, by, will be used by you to accomplish your purpose and your plan. And Lord, if we understand that, we understand that even suffering and struggles are good because they accomplish something in our lives to bring us closer to our walk with you. Something that will have eternal benefit and value. Lord, we struggle with those things. I struggle with those things. Lord, change my perspective this morning and make it be what would be right and honoring and glorifying your Son. We thank you in Jesus' name.